Welcome back to The Afterword, a conversation about the future of words. We are so glad to have Joy and Brett here with us to continue our conversation about the background stories centered on sports and social and emotional development. How do you motivate reluctant athletes? I'm pretty sure I was one of these, and I don't think my PE teacher ever figured out how to motivate me. What would you have done, Joy, if I'd been in your class? If I was in your class at uh, your, your international school in Thailand? Yeah. Um, I would just have a conversation about what your interests are and to understand what you're like as, as a, as a human. I mean, if you're interested in a certain football team, then I would try to, um, make my class around that. Um, sometimes it's not always possible in a, in a classroom of like 25, 30 kids. Um, but I would say sometimes when, uh, you've got, a, a committed athlete who is um on the team and they are suddenly just reluctant to join in i would i would ask them to take a break just take a break and take like step away from the sport and just examine and see uh what the root of your feelings are because um there may be something uh that happened on the field that maybe something happened uh between your teammates, with your coach, whatever, whatever the problem is, um, but getting to the root of it and unpacking it and realizing what, uh, what is essentially bothering you and then trying to work through that and maybe coming back with a renewed sense of, uh, interest in it again. Thanks. What do you think, Brett? I think, you know, I think the first thing that we do whenever we're coaching, teaching, managing, inspiring somebody is being connected to them as a person first, right? We often see the utility of what they're doing. So you're talking about eh, not being so motivated in PE. The question is, what are you motivated about? What do you like? What is it, you know, what do you enjoy maybe more than music or the arts or drama? Do you enjoy the mechanics of engineering? Are you, what are the different facets you're a part of? And then trying to translate and to provide why, this skill that we're doing now can relate to your development and growth over there. So for instance, let's say you're in a, an engineering group and you really like, you know, like uh, you know, battle bots, right? Which is a very common thing we're seeing in the United States that people like to build robots and, and, and doing competitions with them. Well, you have to understand human experience and competitive experience to be able to translate it to machines. So trying to engage the student, you, to say, what do you like? And let's, let's use it as an analog. Let's use it as a simulation for what you can learn and make you the, I always try to get my, my athletes, my experiencers to be like a, like a, like an interested tourist. You know, you, you see somebody go to a new city and they've got that wide eyed look of experience and taking everything in. And so what I would try to do is get that out of you. It's like, let's, let's become the tourist in our own experience to learn something about the environment and yourself. Okay. So Holland, if you had Joy and Brett as your teachers, would you have jumped in? Well, at least they would both have started me with something that I liked. Okay. That was, what, that, that was the, the common answer was, we start with who you are and what you like, and we work from there. There you go. We could, you know, bring some of Flannery O'Connor's uh, peacocks and have you running around and chase them. <laughs> 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 All right. So, Brett, you mentioned this a little bit earlier on our first episode. Losing's hard. Nobody likes it. Um, sometimes there's tears, anger, frustration when the game or event has not been won. And, and then, Joy, you talked about, you know, injuries and sometimes, you know, landing that triple uh, correctly. If you might be sidelined as an athlete, and that's another form of loss when you cannot participate. So how do you help athletes um, or I like Brett's word, experiencers, overcome and be resilient and learn from that loss? You know, I'll jump in here first. I, the, I had an experience in my life when I was playing that I got injured. And then the game just got taken away from me in a moment. And it was tough. There was a definite grief moment. And it, it forced me to not really, really enjoy the game anymore. I didn't enjoy going and struggling. But it taught me so much about who I was as, as a person. And it led me to what I'm doing now. I think losing because it's such an element of sport and 
there are winners and losers, even at the youth level. Uh, you know, it, it, we, we tried for a long time to not have scores at some of the youth events, but you ask the kids, they know the score and the parents know the score on the outside. Everybody knows the score. So the difference is, is learning how to win as a, with good sportsmanship and how to lose as good sportsmanship. But then to also say, what did you learn during that experience? I never want somebody to not experience the negative emotions because emotions are real and it helps them understand that if I lost today and I work a little harder, I might not lose tomorrow. And that's a good thing. But I can't also prevent people from losing because then they never have to figure out how to overcome something. So when people do lose, I think the first thing I always try to do is not make them feel better. It's okay to feel the way they feel. It's okay to feel disappointed. It's okay to feel sad because it's a, it's a transient emotion. It's not long lasting. I think a lot of times when we criminalize or we villainize the way we feel, then we try to suppress it and get out of it, which makes it worse. So I think having them tell me what the raw feelings are, it's okay. You know, how does it feel? Well, it feels terrible. Good. Good. You know, sometimes I do get disappointed too. So what are we going to do about it? And by turning it that way, I found that particularly even the youngest of athletes can understand it. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> I can definitely use that with my, with my students too. But um, with some of the higher um, performing or elite athletes, I realize that sometimes when they lose a meet um, or they don't get the score that they're hoping for, it becomes very catastrophized. Well, what they do is they catastrophize it. And for them, because their life is all about this sport, it's the end of the world for them. It's absolutely. And I think as as coaches uh, and, and people that support athletes, it's important for them to have a very balanced lifestyle, to have to realize that sports is not everything. You've got your family, you've got your friends, you've got other aspects of life that, you know, sports is, is one aspect of it. And it's, it's not the end of the world for one. Um, but as, as uh, people that support children, I think it's, it's also helpful to, redirect redirect their their sadness to it as brett said it is okay it is absolutely fine to feel these these negative emotions because we can learn so much from that and to sometimes they feel it's so final because that's the end of it and they have nothing to look forward to what we could do is to say hey yeah we didn't get the score that we wanted at this meet but we still got two other meets that we can look forward to we can we have this overseas trip to look forward to and so sometimes they're like oh okay i didn't get uh you know the result that i wanted but i i can learn from this and maybe make up for it in my next other um opportunities um so i think that that could help sometimes when um yeah especially when they're so fixated on um uh, a certain outcome um, and maybe, you know, having that pep talk before and to realize, you know, you can only do what you can do. You can't, um, you can't uh, dictate what the other teams do. You can't, you have no idea what the referee is going to call, you know, so it's, it's very much accepting what you can control and just leaving the rest up to whatever will happen. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. You have to, you, otherwise you're not going to survive. Ahead, yeah, and I'll add one thing to that, what you're talking about, Joy, because I think you're right on the money. I think a lot of times our youth athletes are looking for the adults on how they model the right behavior. And I find a lot of stress for our youth athletes come from their parents because parents want to be helpful. We want to give our kids every opportunity to succeed, but sometimes that comes across as judgmental or that they're failing. And instead of modeling it of knowing how to handle disappointment, if the parent themselves can't handle disappointment, it's very hard to expect our kids to be able to handle it. So if they can handle it, if they can manage it, if they can be a part of it, if they can understand how to work through it, then, then they're modeling a behavior for the kid to understand, the youth athlete to understand, yes, not happy. I can accept the responsibility of it, but I can direct that energy to something else. There is a tomorrow versus what did I do wrong and I've got to fix every problem I have. Just, mm -hmm. I think that as parents, we have to, not model a fix-it mindset versus a developmental mindset. Not everything needs to be fixed. Sometimes the competition itself is just difficult. Yeah, that's that fixed and uh, growth mindset with Carol Dweck. I love that. Excellent. Thank you all. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking about how parents 
may respond and and how they model um, their reactions to disappointment. You know, a lot of athletes at all levels have experienced some really harsh feedback, um, some bullying from peers, from parents, from coaches, uh, maybe from the public. How do you cope with that? Mm, wow. Um, uh, very difficultly. <laughs> We're often taxing the underlying psychological system that may not be prepared for it. Right now, there's an interesting dynamic I'm watching in college sports, particularly with the increased mental health movement, which is wonderful. And, and working in athletic departments, I'm, I very much applaud it, um, and as a clinician as well. But sometimes what we're starting to see is that athletes are struggling with the negative feedback, the negative coaching cycles, criticism, bullying, and the impact on their mental health. And then what results in is athletes feel the most support by the outside community placing it on social media and getting a lot of support for it. And that may be one way to, to manage the bullying. And obviously my answer to that is always, I don't want to ever see anybody suffer or struggle personally or emotionally. I also want to know the whole story because I want to, if there's an opportunity to educate a coach to not put a player through that because generations are changing and we have to be careful of the words we use and the manner of which we share them, that we don't want somebody to have to suffer from a bullying mindset when there's a power dynamic. How do you cope from it? Well, honestly, one of the most important things is to try to remove yourself from a painful or punishing situation. That's not always possible. And so, therefore, we have to increase our external resources to help those athletes that are in those relationships. I think as much as possible, if we're able to call it out and to let the people that have been bullied know that it's not acceptable, that that's not something that we stand for and we stand up and we advocate for them. Um, then they can see how that is not okay. And, and that is that we're supporting them, that certain behavior is, is not acceptable. And, and that as a society, we have to stand together and realize that um, it's just wrong. Yeah, and Joy, you you alluded a little bit to that in the opening of your Cliff Notes version of your life. I mean, you almost you sounded like you experienced that on a personal level. Yeah, it, it definitely was. Um, and my mom, I mean, being Asian, you know, she kind of just thought that teachers and coaches were, you know, were God sent from heaven. And unfortunately, she wasn't able to stand up, which it made it even worse, basically. Uh, yeah. But then growing up as a, a teenager and young adult, then you you get to realize that that's not really, uh, that's not correct. Okay. But you were able to overcome that hurdle. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, with, with mentors and with people and friends that, that do support you, I think absolutely those, those sometimes it takes sometimes a, a moment in or, um, uh, a single moment in sports or uh, in your learning uh, that could take years to overcome. But yeah, eventually you, you get there. Yeah. Go ahead, Brett. Joy, you said something. Yeah. You said something earlier that, that struck me with regards to being shamed and body shamed. I had an athlete that I worked with who um, family was from China and she went back to China to train as a diver oh. and she didn't trust her coaches because come to find out she had had 31 different dive coaches in China because coaches were so uh, rewarded for finding gold medalists that they would quit on her as soon as they felt that she wasn't living up to their ideal state of being a diver. So we had a long, we had a lot of boundary issues with regards to helping her trust what their coaches were saying without rejecting her. Yeah. And, you know, we, we see that in, let's say China and using that as a harsh example. But we see that in the United States, too. And we see it with regards to athletes that we're trying to identify as travel ball players or who is college recruitable. And we're seeing that with colleges, you know, pretty much saying a kid is not of their level as early as freshman in high school, which is absurd. And kids and youth athletes, they're struggling. They're not developed. They're not emotionally developed. Here they are having to be having to fend off of the stress and the rejection of adults. Mm. And it's a really scary, slippery slope. And, and Joy lived it. I was fortunate I didn't. But it's, it's an unfortunate thing. And, and, and 
I think there's so much that we need to do there in order for our sport to transfer to life and to be a positive in, uh, analog. Mm, so good. And you just stepped right into this, my next question then, Brett, because we've seen some positives. Um, sports are changing. Um, we've seen some athletes step away, as Joy said, um, from, I can think of some tennis um, pro, uh, professionals that have stepped away from the game for a while. Um, so what are some trends you see that you would, that you would like to see maybe continue in the future? Well, you, you, you mentioned Ash Bard, I mean, somebody like Ash Barty, number one tennis player in the world, just stepped away and retired because she's burnt out and exhausted. And she did it as a junior player too, which tells me that she puts everything she has into it until she has nothing else to give and just goes to a point of exhaustion. I think one of the biggest trends is the, the understanding of mental health burden among our athletes. So a couple months ago, I was having a conversation with Michael Phelps. One of my players is a very close friend of his, and we were together at a dinner party. It's a heck of a name drop, so I just had to do it. So, but anyway, Good for you, Michael, Brett. I know, yeah. I know. My wife, my wife was there, and she wanted a picture, and I refused to take one. Um, but, you know, he, he's the most decorated male athlete of all time and probably the finest male athlete most, you know, of all time. And yet he's been a champion of mental health needs because of the burden that sports has placed on him. And we had a conversation about what are the needs of our athletes today. And he said, all I want to do is make sure that athletes out there and the young, the youth, the older understand the mental health burden. And it's something that I've been championing for a long time is that just because we play sports doesn't mean that we're mental health, you know, healthy all the time. We do have ups and downs. And so one of the biggest trends I want to see is that we continue to understand and appreciate the mental health burden of our athletes and give them the right resources so that it boils down to the youth level. And I think the Players' Tribune, which is an online resource, is one of the finest avenues to study and understand the experience of sport from an athlete's firsthand view. Simone Biles, Ash Barty, uh, Theo Fleury, Michael Phelps, and so on are continuing to share stories, even Serena Williams. So we just need to keep telling the story more and more. And that's the most positive trend that we can. Not to say that sports are dangerous, but that sports can bridge a gap to help us understand and get the healing that we need oftentimes. Okay. And Brett, what was that called again? Players what? It's called the Players Tribune. It's a website online. And it, I think it was started by Derek Jeter, who's the former shortstop of the yeah. uh, New, York, New York Yankees. And he started, and it was started off as kind of like, I don't think they meant it to start off as like a mental health thing. I think it was just like, hey, tell a story from your perspective of playing in the Super Bowl. And then all of a sudden it became uh, Dear So-and-So. And it shared the story of how they struggled with panic attacks. And those articles became so positive and powerful and helped so many people. And I think we just really need to understand that when we see athletes competing on the field, doesn't mean that they've got it perfect, that they're putting in a lot and there's a burden there. Got it. All right. How about you, Joy? Yeah, I think Brett mentioned uh, about Simone Biles, and that was, you know, the Olympics in um, 2021. And uh, she got, I think, very mixed reviews for stepping away. I mean, as a gymnastics coach and, and judge, I could very much um, attest to how dangerous uh, she was um, in terms of her mental health state at the time. And and I'm not sure if, if uh you're aware that she was putting herself in danger if she were to continue um, competing. And I think a lot of people, not just Americans, but uh, people across the world didn't realize that it, it could be, she could, she could die from, from attempting those vaults. And, and so I think for some it's, it's mental health. And for some it's absolutely hers in her situation. It was absolutely life and death. And she chose to, and I'm so glad that she did because not only is she showing that it's okay to step away to put your health first or your life first, um, it's it's also showing that you know uh, the pressure, like what Brett said, the pressure from society and um, and not doing something that what society demands of you and what they they expect of you even and really all these full time athletes this is their this they're spending upwards of 40 hours a week on this people fail to realize that this is 
this is not uh, just, you know, a recreational sport for them. It's it's their life. And so it's it's equivalent to saying, like, if you don't do a presentation or you do your deck incorrectly and you're berated in front of your bosses and your clients. And, you know, it's it's people don't see that. But you're you're putting your life's work on on the field. You're putting your work it's on television and it's on social media and everyone can see that. Um, and so just take things into perspective and, and to step away when it's absolutely the right thing for you to do. And it doesn't matter that other people don't agree with it. Um, but that I think other people championing and to support their decision to step away really helps. Mm. And it shows other people that it's okay too. Excellent. Boy, these are good trends. I really love that. I, I, um, when you were talking joy, I could just think of me doing a presentation in front of an Olympic audience um, from my job. How scary would that be, you know, and to be graded on that. And that's, you know, so that's a great, that's a great word picture. All right. Well, we're down to our final question. What's a metaphor to help us better understand social and emotional development in sports? I'll go with uh, climbing a mountain. You're going to have to educate me. I'm, I'm going with a metaphor, not a simile, right? So uh, I would say climbing a mountain is that the further we go, the harder it actually gets because there's more at stake. There's more consequence. There's fewer people on the mountain, but yet it requires more of us to succeed at the higher levels. And oftentimes when we're in any competition, the closer we are to success, if we lose there, it often hurts worse than if we lost right out of the gate. And so it's, it's a weird dynamic. So I often teach my athletes to think about it like climbing a mountain is that the first time you're on Mount Everest may not be the best time you've ever been there, but you have to hire a Sherpa and, a, and an organization to help you get there. You just don't go start climbing by yourself for the first time and think, oh, I can do it. Is that you're facing challenges every step of the way in order to get to different base camps to get to the top. Wow, that was great. Yeah, that's a great one. I don't know if I can top that. <laughs> well, this is not a competition. I was just about to say, well said, Colin, well said. Absolutely um, not. Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> All right. Well, before we completely wind up, uh, Brett, would you tell us a little bit about your work and where people can find out more about what you're doing purchase anything you've uh, written or uh, maybe follow you on social media? Absolutely. You can follow me at brettmccabe.com and I spell my name B-H-R-E-T-T. -T. It's something I did when I was in kindergarten and it's stuck ever since. So it's B-H-R-E-T-T-M-C-C-A-B as in boy E. Uh, you can find all my information. I've got a podcast called The Secrets to Winning. Um, but I also just recently wrote another book called Break Free from Suckville. And Suckville is, most people laugh about it from a word standpoint, but it's because most people feel like they're falling short of their goals and their potential. And when they feel, they always then feel like they suck and that's not true. And so I'll, the book is written to help people understand that they have capability to do a lot of things there and to have success by creating and making their reality better versus anchoring to the stars. And so that's kind of what I, my whole focus of my work is, is to help people understand what they're capable of doing by making their circumstance and their environment better today. And so if you want more, you can go to my website at brettmccabe.com. And the book is called Break Out of Suckville? Break Free from Suckville. Break Free from Suckville. All right, that sounds yep. really good. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely, the goal is to catch your attention, but it's funny because how it started was I, I was explaining to a, an athlete one day, a professional, and he said, you know what, Doc? I'm the mayor of Suckville. And I was like, that's it. He named it and ran with it. And it's so funny because athletes look at it and go, you're describing me. It's, it's there. They can, they can see it. So that's kind of how it started. Right. Well, thank you very much. Joy, how thank can you. people connect with you, follow you on social media, watch you on TV? Uh, <laughs> what, what, what can we do? How can we get to know you and follow you? Well, actually, before that, I'd like to say, like, Brett, that, that name totally sticks. I, I love it because it's so relatable too, because the, the words that we use on ourselves is so much harsher than what we use on, on other people. And so it's absolutely relatable. And I, I can, I think most people will, will be able to see themselves in that. So thanks for that. 
Yeah. Well, for me, um, I was recently on um, a TV show called The Apprentice, One Championship Edition. Um, it's uh, It was filmed in Singapore uh, with uh, One Championship, which is the rival organization of, I think, well, it's UFC. Um, and so you can catch me there on uh, a few episodes. Um, due to, because I'm, I'm working for an international school and due to child safeguarding, I'm I don't really have a public profile, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, you can catch me on TV there. All right. Well, that had to be an exciting experience to be on, on a show like that. Yeah. And there are articles, by the way, about you. Yeah, a couple. <laughs> so people, can, people can Google oh, Joy Ko, K-O-H, <laughs> and, uh, and learn what you have shared with the folks on The Apprentice, even if they don't get a chance to watch it. Yeah. Thank you. So we can ask everyone else to join us next week for a conversation. We'll be starting a new theme. We'll be talking about safety. Um, and we're, we're going to start with an episode on personal identity and bullying. Yes. And, and that safety being, is there, um, as Holland was saying when we were thinking about this theme, is anything really safe? <laughs> so this is a little tug in cheek. Um, as we think about this next theme. But thank you so much, Joy and Brett. This was absolutely an uh, important conversation. So thankful for you all to be with us. Everyone else, please leave us a review. Rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Please become a subscriber to theafterwordpodcast.com. And if you would like to purchase one of our little Afterword stickers, go to our website, leave us a message. We'll make sure we get one to you. And remember... You are welcome at our table.